Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome to another week of teaching. Today, we are honored and privileged to have Dr. Deirdre McPherson from uh, C14 and Kuroski Trauma. As you can see, she's a, a trauma surgery and critical care fellow. And correct me if I'm wrong, the first one from Cape Town in trauma surgery. Uh, yeah, the first one uh, trained at, at Rotiski, first South African trained at Rotiski. Oh, so, I mean, I, I was going to go through your CV, but I thought that might take the entire hour. Um, <laughs> but just basically, for those who don't know, Deirdre is currently working at C14. Um, she's trained in Cape Town in at Stellenbosch and has done numerous presentations as a primary author on many things. Um, I think your interests include mainly sort of penetrating trauma. Um, and I see you've got a couple of awards for presenting at, at things. So we are really privileged and honored to have you here. Um, and for anyone that has worked at C14, you know that Deirdre makes your life a lot better there than what usually goes on. So um, without getting into anything more, I'd just like to welcome you again and thank you for taking the time to um, address us during this um, period of COVID plus this new trauma surge is coming up. So without further ado, over to you, Deirdre. Okay, uh, thank you so much, uh, Cameron, for the opportunity to talk to you guys and then also for that introduction. Uh, my talk today is based mainly on trauma resuscitation. We'll go through some basic principles again and then finally look at uh, the massive transfusion protocol versus the tech guided resuscitation, which is the new, you know, buzzword. Um, so the outline of the talk is basically a quick background. Uh, I'll be talking about the most commonly used blood products. We'll go over uh, trauma-induced coagulopathy quickly as well as the TIG, and then look at some evidence for the massive transfusion protocol versus the TIG-guided uh, resuscitation. So as we all of us know, uh, hemorrhage is one of the most common causes of death within the first hour of arrival to a trauma center. And more than 80% of deaths in the operating theater and 50% of deaths in the first 24 hours after injury are due to exsanguination and coagulopathy. Only 3% of civilian trauma patients receive a massive transfusion, but these patients actually consume 70% of all the blood transfused at the trauma center. So if we quickly look at uh, PAC3 blood cells, uh, it's made from a unit of whole blood, uh, it's centrifuged and most of the plasma is removed, uh, which then leaves the unit of blood with a hematic rate of about 60%. Um, so one unit of red blood cells will raise the hematic rate about 3%, and it's usually stored between 1 to 6 degrees for a maximum of 42 degrees, I mean 42 days. Uh, there is some evidence, uh, they were looking at um, old versus new blood, and the effect it has on outcome, and by old blood I mean 42 day old, and new, new blood, uh, one day old blood, and they found that there's actually no difference in outcome whether you're giving somebody blood that has just been donated versus that it has been stored uh, for 42 days. So the advantages of packed red blood cells compared to whole blood are that it's a much smaller volume. It's got a lower plasma protein content, a lower citrate, potassium, sodium, and bicarbonate content, as well as a lower white cell count and platelet content. Whole blood, on the other hand, is the complex tissue from which uh, clinically appropriate components are usually processed. And it's important to note that components usually quickly deteriorate in whole blood within hours of donation and the, the, specifically the platelets and clotting factors. Uh, currently the clinical indications for using whole blood are limited because red blood cells are more appropriate in most situations um, and usually more readily available. So indications for whole blood are acute blood loss, so massive transfusion or loss of 30 to 40% of your total blood volume. Uh, within uh, 24 hours, exchange transfusions, and then emergency conditions when there's no other option. More and more people are starting to use whole blood for um, massive transfusions um, in trauma. And I mean, ATL is also puts this in their guidelines now for uh, resuscitation. If we look at fresh frozen plasma, um, this is uh, separated from anticoagulated whole blood within 18 hours of donation. It contains all coagulation factors at normal physiological parameters, including the label factors 5 and 8. Uh, it should never be used as a plasma expander, and it's important to remember to always thaw this before you transfuse. 
you, the FFPs have to be stored um, at less than a uh, minus 30 degrees. Um, you can store it for a maximum of 24 months. Uh, post uh, thaw, you have to store it only for four hours at room air. If you're storing it at one to six degrees, you can store it for a maximum of one to five days. The dose usually given is 10 to 15 milliliters per kg. Uh, you can transfuse by ABO group and then you must transfuse within 15 to 20 minutes and the volume is approximately 300 ml. Uh, this slide is just depicting the FFP composition. Uh, as you guys know, it's coagulation factors and other proteins and then solutes. So indications for FFP are iron are more than 1.6, the emergent reversal of warfarin, uh, QDRC, and then microvascular bleeding during massive transfusion. Um, there are two RCTs uh, that have been conducted on the use of plasma. Um, the first one uh, is the combat trial, uh, the control of major bleeding after trauma trial, which was published in 2018 in The Lancet. Um, so this randomized normal cell line versus FFP. Uh, they actually found that pre-hospital use of FFP compared to cell line was not associated with increased survival uh, during rapid ground rescue in an urban setting. And in contrast, the pamphlet trial, also published in 2018 in the New England Journal of Medicine, um, also known as the pre-hospital plasma during air medical transport, in trauma patients at risk for hemorrhagic shock trial, quite a long name, they actually found that pre-hospital administration of thawed plasma was safer and it resulted in a lower 30-day mortality than standard care resuscitation. And standard care resuscitation here is also referring to a crystalloid-based um, resuscitation. Uh, if we look at freeze-dried plasma, um, this is a component that was first developed uh, in World War II um, and has been, was used specifically there for um, uh, hemorrhagic shock. Uh, it was actually used up until 1968 in greater amounts, um, but then they, they found that there was very really large contamination um, in the Korean War of hepatitis B. They had a 21% transmission rate. And then it sort of fell out of vogue. And in the early... Um, 1990s, uh, people stopped using it. In the early 2000s, people started really looking into it again at, at, as early as like 2003. And as recent as 2016, uh, they have been developing new technologies to decrease transmission rate with um, FTPs, and it has been used more and more frequently now. Um, compared to uh, FFPs, um, FTP does have the advantage that you can actually store it for more than a year. Um, at a temperature of up to 25 degrees. So it's quite heat stable, so you can store it um, in your front room. Um, it's also got a very short reconstitution time, at about 10 minutes when you just mix it with sterile water. And then you can also um, make the solution hypertonic, so the additives could blunt a negative hyperinflammatory cascade that you get with trauma. Um, there have been some in vitro studies that have shown FTP is equivalent to FFP uh, regarding coagulation and clotting capacities. Um, and then some animal studies, which have also shown that FTP is comparable to FFP uh, regarding tolerance and treatment-related complications. And there is this potential now that the FTP undergoes post-dying viral inactivation and can be made ABO um, universal. So logistical advantages of FTP then um, facilitate its inclusion in major hemorrhage control, even in some pre-hospital settings. So FTP is actually prepared in two ways. Uh, the first is a, a freeze-dried lipophilized uh, with a combination of low temperature pressure and low moisture circulating air. Uh, the second way is spray-dried, where it's aerosolized into a high temperature chamber to remove moisture. Um, it actually can be stored in either of these forms of minimal protein degradation until it's actually reconstituted, pH adjusted and administered. So reconstituted lipophilized if, if FTP actually maintains an average of 86% of the coagulation factor activity when it's compared to FFP. In contrast, though, the spray-dried um, FTP has a reduction in several factors. Um, so 25% for fibrinogen and protein S, 50% uh, reduction for von Willebrand fact, uh, factor, 70% for factors 5 and 8. Um, but this is shown to have no effect uh, on the 
availability of is um, spray dried um, FTP to generate thrombin. So if we look at a literature comparing FFP to FDP, there have been two studies. These were um, uh, prospective observational studies that uh, looked at FTP versus FFP, and they actually found no difference in mortality. The only problem with these studies is that these are results from military studies. So the generalization of the conclusions made here on the clinical effects are quite questionable because, as we know, subjects in military settings are often more younger male adults than in civilian settings, and the type of injuries also differ. So this difference in demographics really makes the comparison difficult. Um, so more studies concerning FTP in the civilian setting are needed. Um, currently, there are three trials ongoing um, looking at FTP use um, in Norway, France and Great Britain, and the two in France and Great Britain are actually randomized controlled trials, so we just have to wait and see what that actually shows. Disadvantages of FTP are that it is actually more expensive than FFP per unit, um, so introducing it into your pre-hospital or hospital use would actually raise expenses. Um, and the logistical advantage that it does have may actually be insignificant in urban regions with a short transport time. So actually, at this we don't actually use FTP. We use FFP because we've got the blood bank on, on site, like, I mean, less than a minute away from our trauma unit. Um, in KZN, they use FTP a lot, and that because, you know, they can store it in the, in the emergency unit. In Harting, I know they're also not using um, FTP in their level one trauma centers. If we look at cryo, um, cryo is then the cold insoluble fraction of FD, FFP components, um, including fibrinogen factor 8 from valerian factor, factor 13 and fibronectin. It's usually manufactured by thawing FFP at 0 to 4 degrees, then freezing it, um, and stored at minus 18 degrees. Uh, the dose is usually one unit of cryo per 10 kg body weight. A pool of cryo is from four to five donors, and that gives you a volume of about 100 to 250 mL. So the indications for cryo, usually for image after cardiac surgery, massive hemorrhage or transfusion, and then surgical bleeding. Uh, if we look at platelets, um, a single unit is usually derived from one whole blood unit collected. Um, it's stored at room temperature and cannot be frozen. So it's stored at minus 22 plus minus 2 degrees with gentle agitation and only has a shelf life of five days. So pooled platelets um, are derived from buffy coat layers of whole blood donation separated within eight hours of donation. And buffy coats from usually four to five donations are pooled and then resuspended in either plasma or platelet additive solution. Um, it contains uh, 2.4 times 10 to 11 platelets. Uh, it's cheaper to produce but the exposure to the recipient does increase because of the four to five donors. A single donor, on the other hand, is obtained by aphidesis. So there's only one donor exposure to the recipient, but uh, the cost is high. Uh, it does have the advantage uh, that the recipient's HLA type can be matched to a platelet donor with a similar HLA type to deal with problems of HLA allo immunization. Um, and then it, has, it gives an incremental increase in platelet count about 30 to 60,000 for each six pack of platelets. If we briefly look at uh, trauma induced coagulopathy, we all know that pre existing conditions such as age, genetics, comorbidities, and pre injury medication, and these are your anticoagulants, warfarin, et cetera, that your patient is on, or even the pre hospital fluid administration, has an effect on trauma. Um, so when the patient actually has trauma, uh, tissue damage and hemorrhage occurs, which does lead to shock. This shock results in a hyperperfusion, which then in turn results in a systemic endothelopathy. And this is secondary to inflammation, platelet activation and dysfunction, reduced clotting factor activity, hyperfibrinolysis, endogenous heparinization, glycocalyx shedding, as well as sympathogenal activation. And all of this, the systemic endothelopathy, with trauma-associated factors and resuscitation-associated factors, leads to our 
trauma uh, trauma induced coagulopathy are multifactorial so if you look at trauma associated factors factors that influence this this is your coagulation factor loss and your coagulation factor consumption and then resuscitation associated factors such as um, coagulation factor um, dilution hypothermia and acidosis this is just a brief quick overview of the TIG again as we know um, the TIG measures um, the, whole assess uh, the whole assessment of coagulation and, and gives us a graph afterwards. Um, the R time is the time to start forming the clot. And usually if it's prolonged, you have a problem with coagulation factors and the treatment for that would be a FFP. The K time is the time until the clot reaches a fixed strength. Um, usually if, if it's prolonged or, or uh, decreased the problem with fibrinogen. Um, the alpha angle is the speed of fibrin accumulation. Um, also, if that is increased or decreased, is a problem with fibrinogen. Your maximum amplitude, your highest vertical amplitude of the tick, um, usually a problem with platelets, and then lysis at 30 minutes. That's the percentage of amplitude reduction 30 minutes after maximum amplitude. Um, and if it's increased, um, there is uh, usually excess fibrin and lysis. And this, this is a very nice. Um, slide it, but it just quickly gives you a quick um, uh, overview of the normal values and then what it should actually be treated with. This slide is also just for you to go through at your own leisure, just of the common uh, tick patterns that you should know um, and which would make it actually quite easy for you to recognize in an emergency situation. So it's something that must be taken into consideration is the actual time frame with which it, what it take, with, that it takes actually to do a TIG. So usually a standard TIG takes about 60 minutes. And as you know, that's way too long if you're busy with a, a P1 resuscitation and the patient needs to be resuscitated. So um, acceleration of TIG is actually quite important. And the assays are usually accelerated with the addition of kaolin, which activates factor 12 which then mimics the intrinsic pathway and the rapid TIG, which is the addition of tissue factor. And this simulates the extrinsic pathway. This, this uh, in combination uh, reports clot initiation as an activated clotting time in seconds instead of the R time in minutes. And this takes approximately 15 minutes to do, <clears throat> to do the, um, the TIG. So the, the, the time is actually quite reduced if you do add um, these as um, uh, these additives actually to the to the assay. In other important uh, points to remember is that the tick can be performed on whole blood with no anticoagulant, whole blood that's collected into sodium citrate, and then also whole blood that's into heparin. Uh, there's been many studies done recently actually on the effect of citrate on tick, and they showed actually that um, the citrated samples have variable results if your assay is performed within five minutes of collection, but it stabilizes after five minutes for up to two hours. So from five minutes to two hours, you can do your TIG without the citrate actually having an effect on it. Some important other points is just to identify whether your sample is anticoagulated or not. Um, and then if that sample is anti uh, it doesn't have any anticoagulation, your assay must be performed within four minutes. If it's collected in citrate, you've got five to minutes to two hours. Um, important to take note that the instrument um, is adjusted to match the patient's core temperature. Uh, and this is actually useful during cardiopulmonary bypass and then obviously interoperatively um, uh, for protective hypothermia. At, in trauma, we prefer to run the TIG assay at the ideal temperature of 37 degrees. And that's the CC mastosis at the goal temperature to which the patient will actually be resuscitated. Some new advances just to take note of in TIG, the newer machines don't use the pin and cap method that we all know. Um, they use resonance. Um, the blood is exposed basically to a fixed vibration frequency range, and then they've got a detector uh, that measures the vertical motion of the blood meniscus under LED illumination and that transforms the movement into tracing of clot dynamics. Uh, pipettes are also no longer used, uh, uh, they now use prepackaged cartridges to perform the TIG. The limitations of scale elastic assays are that they don't reflect interactions that occur between the fluid phase of coagulation and the endothelial cell surface, 
which is present in the coagulopathic uh, patient. Also, that platelet inhibition and dysfunction may not be evident with standard assays um, unless thrombin is inhibited and platelet agonists are utilized in a specialized TIG um, platelet mapping assay. And TIG and the results are quite operator dependent. Uh, there can be sampling and processing errors and intersampling uh, variability. An important uh, study um, that has looked at uh, TIG and basically secured its um, use in trauma is a randomized controlled trial that was um, published in 2016 in the Annals of Surgery, uh, looking at goal-directed hemostatic resuscitation of trauma-induced coagulopathy. Uh, this is a pragmatic randomized clinical trial that compared viscoelastic assay to conventional um, coagulation assays. Um, so patients uh, requiring um, massive transfusion were randomized to either tech guided resus or to a conventional coagulation testing guided resus. They enrolled about uh, 111 patients, 56 in the TIG arm, 55 undergoing the conventional um, guided resuscitation, and the endpoint was 28 day survival. Um, TIG guided resuscitation actually resulted in a reduced mortality um, in, at 28 days. Uh, so 19.6% versus 36.4% in the conventional coagulation testing group. Those receiving the tech guided resource um, required actually fewer blood products overall, and they actually had more ICU-free and ventilator-free days. Um, so the utilization of a goal-directed tech guided massive transfusion protocol to resuscitate severely injured patients improved survival compared to a massive transfusion protocol guided by conventional coagulation assays. Also utilizes less plasma and platelet transfusions during the early phase of resuscitation. If we look at massive transfusions, usually defined as a transfusion of 10 units of packed red blood cells in the 24-hour period, blood products are usually administered at, in a balanced ratio of 1 is to 1 is to 1. Uh, so that's plasma, platelets, and red blood cells. This ratio is the closest approximation to reconstituted uh, whole blood. And progress is usually assessed with the TIG in conjunction with static and dynamic endpoints of resuscitation. The trial that secured a uh, massive transfusion protocol of 1 is to 1 is to 1 um, was published in JAMA in 2015. And this is known as the proper randomized clinical trial. So transfusion of plasma, platelets, and red blood cells in a 1 is to 1 is to 1 versus a 1 is to 1 is to 2 ratio um, and mortality in patients with severe trauma. So this was an RCT. Um, 680 patients were randomized to a 1 is to 1 is to 1 ratio. There were 338 patients in that arm. Um, and the next 342 patients were randomized to 1 is to 1 is to 2. Uh, primary outcomes of the study were 24-hour and 30-day all-cause mortality. Um, ancillary outcomes included the time to hemostasis, blood product volumes transfused, complications, the incidence of surgical procedures, and functional status. They found no significant differences um, in mortality at 24 hours or 30 days between the two groups. Um, they found that exsanguination um, was actually significantly decreased in the 1 is to 1 is to 1 group. So that's 9.2% versus 14% mortality. Um, yeah, basic uh, exsanguination is in the 1 is to 1 is to 2 group. Also found that more patients in the 1 is to 1 is to 1 group achieved hemostasis than in the other group. And no differences were actually found between the two groups for the 23 uh, pre specified complications. Um, when actually deciding to do a massive transfusion, um, many centers actually advocate for the use of the ABC score or assessment of blood consumption score. So this is quite a well-validated scoring system. It consists of four variables. Uh, that's looking at heart rate, more than 120, systolic blood pressure less than 90, a positive fast, and a penetrating torso injury. And each of these variables are actually assigned one point. Um, and a score of more than two warrants massive transfusion protocol activation. The, the, one, the issues with this score is that it actually overestimates the need for transfusion. So it's got a positive predictive value of 50 to 55%. 
Um, but it is excellent at identifying those who will not need a massive transfusion with a negative predictive value of less than 5%. So the criteria to trigger the activation of a massive transfusion are an ABC score of two or more, um, persistent hemodynamic instability, active bleeding that requires operation or angioembolization, or blood transfusion in the true way. And that's uh, not, I'm not talking about one or two units, I'm talking about the constant need to actually transfuse the patient while the patient is in the front room. If these triggers are met, you transfuse your universal um, red blood cells if you don't have tight blood available and then in plasma in a ratio of one is to one and then you transfuse one single donor apodesis or random donor platelet pool for each six units of red blood cells remember that day eh? um, and then red blood cells and plasma are, de are delivered in by a rapid transfuser and through a blood warmer platelets and cryo should not be administered through the blood warmer once your major bleeding has been controlled and the rate of transfusion has slowed, um, you can switch to laboratory or point of care based transfusion. With, when talking about massive transfusion, one needs to talk about principles of damage control resuscitation because these actually go hand in hand. And damage control resuscitation is basically strategies to decrease mortality and morbidity in the severely injured trauma patient. What it consists of is a permissive hypotension or what we call a hypotensive resuscitation. So providing the patient with minimal normal tension, and that's basically not to pop the clot. Uh, so we do a hemostatic resuscitation, that's our massive transfusion protocol, and then a hemorrhage control, early hemorrhage control, and that's with our damage control surgery. And then we also have to think about prevention and treatment of hypothermia, acidosis, and hypocalcemia forming part of our trial of death in, in trauma. So our initial transfusion rate, uh, when we are transfusing patients, should restore perfusion, but should allow for permissive hypotension until the operation or angioembolization has begun. So our goals then, while we're doing our massive transfusion, if we're taking our damage control resuscitation into consideration, should be to maintain a systolic of about 80 to 90 millimeters mercury, and remember then the um, traumatic brain injured patient and acute spinal cord injured patient just needs a higher systolic to maintain uh, cerebral perfusion pressure. Um, so we, we aim to have our systolic there between 100 and 110. And then we aim to have our, our MAP between 50 and 60. Um, and then in our uh, head injured and ASCII patients, um, our MAP should be more than 80. Uh, this slide is just depicting uh, the Trauma Society of South Africa's protocol for massive transfusion. Um, this you can go through at your own pace. Um, this is what we are currently using in our unit at Rutiskir Hospital. Uh, so we've got a copy of this in our unit and in the blood bank as well has got a copy of this. So you could actually, if you are in the front in C14 and you see this patient needs a massive transfusion, find the blood bank and say they must please activate um, uh, the massive transfusion protocol and they will know what to do. Uh, sorry. Um, so if we look at endpoints of transfusion, um, these are usually of the, this is of the massive transfusion. Uh, it's based on guidelines from the proper study that I mentioned earlier. Um, so criteria for stopping the massive transfusion should include um, anatomic criteria. So, so that we must have actually gotten control of the bleeding and then physiological criteria um, normalizing the hemodynamic status. So the decision to stop is usually made in intraoperatively in theater, either by the, by the trauma surgeon then and the anesthesia, um, anesthetist. And then if the patient's in ICU already by whoever is in ICU, the intensivist or the trauma surgeon. The targets of our resuscitation, um, as I mentioned earlier, we aim for a, a map of about 60 to 65, a HP of about 7 to 9, uh, INR of less than 1.5, uh, fibrinogen of more than 1.5 to 2, uh, platelets more than 50 times, um, 10, and then a pH of uh, 7.35 to 7.45 and a core temperature of more than 35 degrees Celsius. There are risk and complications associated with massive transfusion that you should be aware of. Um, volume overload, so you need to carefully monitor filling pressures, response to volume and diuresis. You can over-transfuse the patient, so you should be monitoring the HP 
regularly and titrate actually according to the patient's needs. Um, the patient can become hypothermic. Um, so monitor the temperature, use fluid warmers and other measures to reduce heat loss. Um, as I mentioned earlier with the trauma-induced coagulopathy, you can get this dilutional um, coagulopathy of clotting factors and platelets. So you should be doing regular tests. Um, you can get a transfusion-related acute lung, lung injury or trally. Um, uh, excessive citrate um, that causes a metabolic alkalosis and hypocalcemia. Uh, you can get a hyperkalemia as well. Um, and then also, obviously, um, uh, blood-borne disease transmission. Um, yeah, although the, the incidence of this is not as high as it was in previous years. There are some therapeutic adjuncts that are actually used in uh, massive transfusion. Um, antifib antifibrinolytic medications such as tranexemic acid, or amino capraic acid, um, but both of these basically inhibit plasminogen activation and plasmin activity and, and therefore stabilize the clot. Um, the trial that is advocated for this, the use of this um, is the CRASH-2 trial, uh, also known as the clinical randomization of an antifibrinolytic insignificant hemorrhage. Um, uh, this advocates for a, a tranexemic acid dose of one gram over 10 minutes initially. Uh, followed by a trans infusion of one gram over eight hours. Um, and this trial actually recommends um, uh, tranexemic acid in all injured patients who are actively bleeding within three hours of injury. If we look at the, this trial in close, you know, this trial was published in The Lancet in 2010, and it actually reported a, a benefit of 1.5% in mortality. Uh, when administered empirically to all trauma patients. Um, this trial, you know, actually had a lot of criticism regarding the clinical applicability of all its findings because they did not perform any coagulation assays to demonstrate the, the patient's degree of coagulopathy and fibrinolysis and to characterize the effect of the drug on the patient. Um, and also the administration of, of tranexemic acid after three hours was actually associated with increased mortality. Um, they didn't report on any causality or mechanism to explain this. It seems intuitive though that an antifibrinolytic medication such as tranexemic acid should actually only be administered um, if you can demonstrate hyperfibrinolysis. Um, there are people that still advocate for empiric administration to all trauma patients. Um, we don't use tranexemic acid in our unit purely because the patient arrives most of the times after three hours, if they refer from the periphery, our other patients that are brought in uh, from the scene, um, we give them blood uh, as soon as possible because the blood bank is um, at our disposal. Um, recombinant uh, activated factor 7a, uh, this was initially developed for the treatment of hemophilia. Um, it, it has been used in some settings um, of traumatic agulopathy. Um, as well as the reversal of warfarin-induced anticoagulation uh, with serious bleeding. The role of it is actually quite unclear. It does appear to reduce um, transfusion requirements, uh, but there is a lack of long-term mortality benefit. And the potential increases in morbidity have placed its position in um, the massive transfusion protocols in doubt. So it's not recommended currently for the management of refractory hemorrhage in trauma. If we look at prothrombin complex concentrates, um, the concentrates contain either three, uh, that's for, um, two, <coughs> nine, and ten, or four, two, um, seven, nine, and ten clotting factors, um, currently licensed for the urgent reversal of warfarin, uh, but sometimes used off label for the management of um, trauma induced agulopathy in Europe. Um, the ACCP guidelines, these are the American um, guidelines. It recommends its use over FFP for warfarin reversal in the setting of major bleeding. If we look at massive transfusion versus TEG then, this is the paper that advocates for a TEG-guided resuscitation. This was published in the Journal of uh, Acute Care um, and Trauma Surgery in 2012. And this looked at TEG-guided resuscitation is superior to a standardized massive transfusion protocol resuscitation in massively transfused penetrating trauma patients. So this um, study compared a TIG-guided uh, massive transfusion protocol 
to a historical code in which massive transfusion uh, was used in with a fixed transfusion ratio of 1 is to 1 is to 1. So all patients included in this uh, study were transfused more than six units of red blood cells in the first 24 hours of arrival. There were 165 patients in the TIG directed group and 124 in the um, historical cohort. The median ISS of the patients ranged from 23 to 29 and not significantly different between the two groups. Um, and the study found that the TIG directed resuscitation is equivalent to our standard MTP if the patient is receiving uh, six or more units of red blood cells. And for blunt uh, patient, uh, blunt trauma patients receiving more than 10 units of red blood cells. It found though that the massive transfusion worsened mortality in penetrating um, trauma patients who received more than 10 units of red blood cells. Overall, there was uh, improved mortality with a TIG guided uh, massive transfusion protocol than a fixed transfusion ratio. So TIG is actually allowed uh, for the characterization of two distinct types of phenotypes in, uh, of trauma-induced coagulopathy. Um, the pathophysiological mechanisms of this trauma-induced coagulopathy may be different in different patients based on your uh, patient characteristics, their comorbidities, and then injury patterns. Um, the first phenotype is a global coagulopathy um, with the depletion of platelets and fibrinogen. And the second phenotype um, is fibrinolysis as the main driver of your trauma-induced coagulopathy. This is just an example uh, of a massive transfusion protocol uh, that is used in the States in one of the um, uh, level one trauma centers incorporating a TIG guided resuscitation. So as we mentioned, um, you know, this, this forms part of your ABC score. Um, and you decide to activate your, your massive transfusion protocol, they use a transfuse four units of red blood cells and two units of FFPs, and then they do a rapid TIG. And then following that, they actually um, assess the patient and give products as per what their TIG result shows. So this is something that we are aiming to, to introduce into our unit, um, but you know we're not quite there yet, uh, considering the, the cost of, uh, of the, the small mobile TIGs. So despite compelling results uh, from trials that compared the TIG guided versus this massive transfusion, there is a larger trial um, underway. Um, and this is actually a randomized control trial because if you remember, the other one was actually comparing uh, the TIG guided resuscitation to a historical code. And this trial is called the ITACTIC trial. Um, it's the implementation of treatment algorithms for the correction of trauma induced coagulopathy trial. Um, and they aim to recruit about 400 patients across Europe, and then they randomized either TIG guided or conventional guided research. They were they expected to report their findings in late 2019, but to date, nothing actually has been published. Uh, so we are waiting that. So in conclusion, um, the greatest clinical application of TIG in trauma is in the guidance of massive transfusion protocols, and that we can see uh, from the evidence presented here today. Um, for, for anyone in the periphery or in currently in the use a massive transfusion protocol if you don't have any TIG available. Always incorporate principles of damage control resuscitation when you are resuscitating an exsanguinating patient. And then I implore you to please donate blood if you can. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, DJ. Thanks a lot. Um, yeah, this is a this is an amazing talk. There's a lot of high yield stuff here, and just for everyone to know that this presentation is has been recorded. It is going to be loaded. Um, the and you've gratefully given us your slides as well, because I'm I, I know for myself I'm definitely going to have to go through this again, um, as you said, at our own pace. Um, I just want to open the floor now for anyone to have any questions. Please, you could either you know post it in the chat, stick up your hand, or pop on your camera, and then um, you know Deirdre is happy to take specific questions around this talk. Okay, maybe maybe I can start. Um, oh, there we go. There's Lauren. So Deirdre, just just a question. Um, so as I'm sure you're aware, we 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 spend most of our lives in the in the periphery, so not not usually at a 
at a so-called level one trauma facility. Um, I mean, arguably Tigerberg has different uh, protocols and guidance and as well as compared to GSH as well as the rest of the country. But for us sitting in, let's say, Mitchell's Plain or, you know, Haderfeld or, or somewhere there, and we identify the person needing a massive transfusion, wh what are the strategies that we can use to sort of assist? So, you know, is, is the ratio of um, in one to one to whatever we have, is, is FFP completely substitutable with FDP if that's all they have there? Um, you know, sometimes the, the hospitals also only have a set amount of blood, which is for the whole entire hospital and not, no blood bank on site. And then the routine administration of TXA, would you still recommend that at the periphery? Um, and what else, if possible, can we do to prevent this TIC um, before sending them through to you? If we yeah, have I think... <laughs> uh, thanks for the question. Now, I think, I mean, you, you, you should still in the periphery be using the tranexemic acid because that patient is probably going to get to you within the three hours of um, injury. And that, I mean, that's mostly what most people have available to them. Um, I mean, uh, in terms of the uh, starting the massive transfusion protocol, I think you can start with what you do have. Um, if we look at the evidence for FTP versus FFP, you can basically equate the FTP to the FFP, the newer version now of the of the FTP. And then we also need to think about substitutes like uh, hemopure and things like that. That's that, that those are other stuff that could actually be used um, in the periphery. And I know there are ongoing studies of that. I think they were going to do a, a study at um, uh, in, at Stellenbosch University. Actually, I'm not sure if it is is still ongoing. Looking at things like like blood substitutes to also help um, get these patients through in the periphery. Um, until they've got time to actually get to um, uh, the level one trauma center. So I think basically in summary, if I can say, I think give the tranexemic acid, resuscitate as you can. Remember, you know, like the permissive hypertension, don't give too much crystalloid and give whatever blood products you do have available. Yeah. And then, um, so I spent a lot of time in Durban and where Tim Hardcastle is a huge proponent of giving autotransfusions, you know, with the synapses and stuff. Yeah, I've got yeah. a lot of varying opinions from people here. Um, so what, what was what's your opinion on the autotransfusion? And is it is it the same as whole blood or does it lack certain things? And what's its effect on the trauma induced coagulopathy? So I think most people like, you know, are sort of fine with actually doing the autotransfusion. We don't do it here per se because most of the patients that come to us usually have in ICDs already. So then it's too late because you actually need to put the, the apron in, 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 you know, in the synapse um, as soon as you start, uh, you know, thinking about wanting to give an autotransfusion. So you need to put that apron in once your ICD is in and then, you know, start from there to start giving the autotransfusion. So as far as evidence goes and things like that, so say this was a polytumor patient that actually had a, um, uh, you know, abdominal injury as well as a thoracic injury. There's actually no evidence that says, you know, it's got an increased... Uh, incidence of sepsis and things like that um, if you're giving the, uh, such a patient the autotransfusion because I think before there was this school of thought that thought if a patient's got a hollow viscous injury of colon small bowel and they've got this you know l um, lung lack you can't actually give them the autotransfusion because we're going to increase uh, you know the rate of sepsis and stuff but there's actually no evidence for that so you, I think you can safely use the autotransfusion if that is actually all that you've got available to you. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Guys anybody else? OK, well, um, I'm sure if, if, if when we go through it again and if we have any questions, um, we could we could probably pose that to you and then in your own time, you could get back to us and maybe address some of those if people do. And then thank you so much for coming on. I'm, no problem. I hope you uh, found this experience useful and maybe you can come back in the future. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 it's a pleasure. I did find it useful. It's good for me to always like read everything again um, and go through all the trials. Um, no, it's been an absolute pleasure. And I don't mind anybody um, messaging me or emailing, popping me an email um, to ask any questions if they do have any questions with regards to the, um, the talk. Awesome. We'll share your details on the, on the okay. on chat and in our group. Thank okay. you so okay. much, Deirdre. Pleasure, guys. Good luck thanks, with all the C14, too. C15 stuff. <laughs> uh, thanks. <laughs>